Hey everyone, I'm Jordan. And I'm Maya. And uh, today we'll be discussing why the physical crime scene supports the Menendez brothers' story. Okay, quick trigger warning, guys. Um, there'll be discussion of homicide, uh, different wounds that were inflicted, and we'll also be showing images with blood in them. So before we like really get into the actual crime scene and the placement of the shot, um, we should probably talk a little bit about shotguns because that was the weapon used in this case. And it's kind of important to understand how a shotgun works to understand why the crime scene shows what it shows. So a shotgun is like a really long weapon and it contains rounds or shells and each shell is like a little casing that contains pellets. So depending on the type of round used, the pellets are different sizes and there are different numbers of them in the round. Shotguns are typically used for like hunting. So you can use them to shoot birds or deer or other game. Um, but they are also used for home protection. With shotguns specifically, say, for example, if I was living in California and I went to some random store where they sold guns, if I asked for a gun for home protection, I would most likely be recommended a shotgun, right? Yeah, because California has, or at the time, I actually don't know if they still have this, um, the gun law was that you could buy a shotgun without any waiting period. But for a handgun, you had to wait, I think it was around two weeks. So if you're looking for a weapon to use for immediate home protection, then that would be the weapon of choice. Because the little pellets, if you're firing from a distance, they spread out. And so they're not individually as lethal as it would be if you think about like a pistol where there's like a bullet that stays together and it creates a big hole. So if you had like someone coming into your home, a home intruder that you shot at a distance with a shotgun, it would be more likely that would be one, it would be more likely that they would be hit. And two, it would be more likely that you wouldn't necessarily kill them. It would just wound them or scare them off. Um, yeah. I think that's why it's used for home protection. This is really, uh, specifically the information about how shotgun rounds disperse is important when discussing the the wounds that the parents received as well. So that will come into play later on. Um, so there's, there's two types of ammunition used in the Menendez case. So there's birdshot, which has a bunch of tiny little pellets in it, because if you're shooting birds, if there's like a flock of birds, you want to be more likely to hit a bird if there's a bunch of little pellets that disperse. And then there's buckshot, which has less pellets, but they're bigger. And that's better if you're shooting at a larger target, like a deer or a buck, that you want it to be more wounded when it gets hit. And when shells are fired, like, depending on the range, they sort of start to spread. So usually when you fire a shotgun at something, the further you are away from it, the more spread you'll see with the the pattern of where the pellets will hit, typically. And this is all very important when it comes to how wounds are inflicted in crimes, and especially this one. That's pretty much all the background, I think, about like how a shotgun works that's important to understanding the physical crime scene in this case. There is a little bit of background that we need to go into of sort of the brother's story of what happened before they 
shot their parents. Um, and we'll go into the details of these events in a later episode, but um, just in terms of understanding why the crime scene supports their story. Okay, so going forward, this is all based on the brother's testimony, but during the week, that whole week of where the shooting occurred on Sunday, but the events that led up to that actually started in the week prior. So during that week um, was when Lyle had confronted his father about molesting Eric and he perceived that his father had threatened him and well, that it was a threat on Lyle's life. Um, during the week, there was more confrontations with the parents where they said some eerie things, which led the brothers to believe that their parents were planning on killing them. And so because of this, they were paranoid and they wanted some f form of self-defense. Yeah. Okay, so on the Friday, they went out to buy guns. They ended up going to a big five and asking for guns for self-defense. When they asked this, they the clerk or whoever was there presented them with shotguns. Lyle just sort of picked up whatever shells were there and just bought them along with the shotguns at the time. However, they learned that it was not the correct ammunition for a shotgun if you wanted to buy a shotgun for self-defense. So it was birdshot. And that's typically used, as the name implies, on birds. Right. Um, they like started thinking, oh, maybe this isn't the right thing to use. So they went to a different store the next day and asked about what ammunition should be used for home protection. And that's when they got the buckshot. So after the brothers purchased the bird shot, when they bought the guns, they loaded a couple of rounds into the shotguns, like that night. But then when they bought the buckshot, they left the buckshot in Eric's car, which was parked in front of the house. During this weekend, the brothers continued to feel threatened by the parents and on Sunday night, which is the night of the shooting, there was a confrontation with the parents where, uh, we'll go into this in further detail in a future episode, like Maya said, but in a nutshell, the brothers wanted to leave the house. Uh, the parents told them they couldn't leave. The brothers took this as the indication that, oh my god, they're going to kill us right now. We need to do something. They then ran to the car, which was parked out the front, and started grabbing shells and just sort of putting the shells in frantically. So when the brothers ran out to the car, they attempted to unload the birdshot that they had put in before and reload with the new buckshot. They then ran into the room. Eric went in first. Lyle was just behind him and they started firing for, like erratically. That's sort of like a general, sort yeah. of like the general sense of like, what happened that night, according to the brothers. And now we're going to go into why the physical crime scene and the placement of the shots supports that story. If you really want to like look at the wounds, you have to watch the testimony of the coroner who testified in the first trial. His name was, is it Dr. Golden? Yeah. He was the doctor who performed the autopsy so yeah while he was performing the autopsy he made a report that indicated information about the wounds inflicted on each parent quick mention this coroner did have some credibility issues but we'll get into that later i'd say like the the, the key findings of the coroner would be all of the wounds except the contact head wounds were distant shots yeah. This is corroborative of the brother's testimony that they were standing at least like, I don't know, a couple meters away from where the parents were at the time. I was just firing as I went into the room. I just started firing. In what direction? In front of me. What was in front of you? My parents. So you were firing at your parents? Yeah. 
essentially the layout of the room was, I, I would say if you're listening to this, I'd recommend looking at a picture of the room and we can like put a diagram into this. Okay, if you have a room that's a square, the door was placed on the left top corner and then along the top wall was the TV and then yeah, in the middle of the room was the coffee table and then there was the couch kind of along the bottom and right wall. It was like a corner sh shaped couch. Sort of like an L shape, yeah. Yeah. And then behind the couch were a bunch of French windows. Is that what they're called? Uh, French doors? French doors. So that's the general layout of the room. And based on the brother's testimony, they entered the room through the doors in the top left corner, and they fired at them from the door area. So they were at a distance from their parents when they first started firing. So the reason that we know that the majority of the shots were distance shots is because, like we were talking about, shotgun pellets spread out when they're fired at a distance. So depending on how far away you are from the eventual target, the pellets continue to sort of spread out as they travel. So the majority of the wounds had the pellets spread out on the parents' bodies, except for the contact wounds, which when a shotgun is fired and it's touching its target, all of the pellets will go in one hole along with the gunpowder. So that's how the coroner was able to say that the distance shots were distance shots. Yeah. And again, it's the kind of thing where, it, like, it, one, it corroborates the brother's story, but it's also corroborative of the defense in that if it was a planned killing, you would typically see a minimum no number of shots, and those shots probably would have been at a closer range as well. Kitty had 10 areas of wounding, and Jose had 6. It's not necessarily... That doesn't necessarily mean that there were 16 shots fired, because it is possible, or likely even, that pellets went through one parent and into the other or that one shot inflicted multiple wounds on one of the parents, so... In fact, I think that's likely the case, because of how shotguns work. Yeah. I mean, the high number of shots is definitely indicative of overkill, which is consistent with, like, both with highly emotional killings and... Heat, yeah, like heat of passion. Heat of passion and unplanned. Yeah. Which, because you wouldn't, if you were planning to kill someone, let's just say hypothetically, you would, first of all, I don't think you'd even use a shotgun, but second of all, you definitely would not shoot like upwards of like 13 times, let's say, because you want to kill that person in the minimum number of shots so that you don't make too much noise so that you're not detected. And typically in these situations where there is a killing that has, that is that the result of prolonged abuse, you do typically see overkill in those situations as well, even in like self-defense killings. The coroner testified that all but two wounds were buckshot, but there were two shots that were birdshot. So this is consistent with the brother's testimony that they were kind of pa panicked scrambling in the car to unload the birdshot that they had put in before, and frantically loaded 
their weapons with buckshot. And are you sure you put in all new stuff? Uh, it was dark. I, I, I tried to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I'm pretty sure. I mean, I was. I tried to do that. Yeah. Because I mean, if they weren't in that panic state, why would there be that mixed ammunition? Because they knew that the buckshot was, I guess you could say, more more deadly. What was what they were supposed to be using. So, if this was something that was like carefully like premeditated beforehand, why weren't their guns already fully loaded with just buckshot? Yeah, I think one another thing that sort of supports the whole running into the room and firing in a complete panic is that two of the shots broke the windows behind the couch, right? Yeah. I don't I don't know, like those two shots that broke out the windows, I think show that they were firing randomly sort of well not completely randomly they were of course shooting at their parents but they were in that panic state where they weren't really thinking rationally and that's why they miss shots do you know if you lined up directly with that second figure or if you were off to the side i i don't know i don't know I just walked into the room, I just started firing, and I don't know. I didn't think about these things. I didn't think, where was this, where was that? I just started firing, and I don't know. Why would the brothers be panicking if the killing was planned? Yeah. The other thing that those window shots corroborate is that the brothers were shooting from the front of the couch. Which, mm -hmm. we'll get to this, but in the second trial, the prosecution tried to argue that the brothers came in and shot their parents from behind first. But to me, those window shots show that they were coming from the front of the couch. It doesn't make any sense that they would come in from behind, shoot their parents, and then continue to the firing front. right <laughs> yeah yeah it doesn't make sense so one of the wounds that jose sustained was to his leg do you know the actual like where it was exactly it was to his left thigh like about right above the knee yeah but it entered on the inside of his thigh and exited on the outside and that was also a distance shot. Yeah. It, it, it makes a lot more sense if you actually look at the crime scene photo, but all, all I will say is that if you look at that crime scene photo, there is no way that Jose sustained that wound while sitting down. It's physically impossible. It does corroborate Lyle's testimony because he swore up and down that his father was standing when he first shot him. When you started firing... Do you remember if your parents were standing or seated, or do you have a clear memory of that? I remember uh, who I realized was my dad at some point, uh, sort of coming forward in my direction. So he was standing, and uh, and I remember firing directly at him. <coughs> if you felt that okay briefly um when lyle was in la county jail he corresponded with a bunch of people he met someone who did like a newspaper thing for people in the la county jail and he befriend befriended her she ended up secretly recording her private conversations with him that there's a part of these tapes where lyle is talking about his lawyers and how his lawyers had said to him like don't worry like you can tell us you can tell us like if like he really was sitting down and lyle essentially says like no like i'm repeatedly telling you my dad was standing up when i shot at him so that leg wound is corroborative of that yeah the re the reason we know or the reason that it's corroborative of that is that there's no blood on the couch where it would have ended up if he was seated on the couch when th 
that shot was fired because yeah. the wound went th- it went through his leg. So if he was seated on the couch at the time that it was fired, there would be blood where the pellets exited his leg. Doctor, with reference to this wound, your arrow indicates that the wound comes in on the inside of the thigh and, and goes out um, in the direction indicated by the arrow, correct? Yes. Now, as the pellets enter that wound, um, and you don't find any pellets in the wound, what happens to the pellets when it comes out the other side of the wound? I... Not exactly sure what you mean by what happens uh, to. Well, what direction? Since there are no wounds in the pellet. Yeah, the the, the leg is. No ex- pellets in the wound. What happens yes. to the pellets? They go out, in the direction of the arrow. And is there also material, blood, and body particles, that are blown out in the same direction? It's yes, that's very possible. And do you see on this side of the couch any indication that uh, there's blood or body particles? Well, I don't no, I don't see any. Uh, I don't see anything uh, to my uh, 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 unaided eye examination. No. Okay, I don't know if I can't remember where I read or heard this. Maybe it was in the second trial transcripts, but essentially for Jose to have received that sh- leg wound and for him to be stand for si- sitting down at the time where his body is in the crime scene photographs one of the brothers would have had to have basically stood on the coffee table in front of him and aimed their shotgun downwards. And that is the only possible way that he could have received that wound while sitting down. So that in itself tells you like how ridiculous the notion is that he received that wound while sitting down, I think. Jose ended up seated on the couch, like the far left end of the couch yeah closest to the um the doors that the brothers came through the other important thing that the coroner testified about was that all of the wounds were anti-mortem which means they were inflicted before death the way that the coroner can determine whether a wound is inflicted before or after death is that When a wound is inflicted before the heart stops beating, it shows bruising because there's still blood flowing in the body. But after the heart stops beating, a wound doesn't bruise. So because all of the wounds showed bruising, that is an indication that they were inflicted before the parents died. And because... Both parents had contact head wounds, which would have been immediately fatal, most likely, like barring a medical miracle. Yeah. The most likely explanation for those wounds being anti-mortem is that the contact head wounds were the last wounds inflicted on each parent. If the sequence of the shots was the head wound first and the person died immediately as a result of that head wound and then started shooting the body in other areas, then those wounds you would see at the autopsy as being post-mortem wounds. If the if the heart stopped immediately there was there were if there was no blood pressure, very likely the other wounds in the sequence would look somewhat different. There wouldn't be as much hemorrhage or as we would say bruising or vital reaction in those wounds. That's correct. And you're saying that those wounds, uh, in this case based on your examination, those wounds were uh, anti-mortem wounds. That is the wounds other than, yes. other than the head wound. Yes. Uh, yes. Everyone had the vital reaction, the bleeding along the wound path, the bruising. That's correct. Which means that one consistent interpretation based on your examination is that all of the wounds except the head wounds were inflicted and then the head wound was inf- inflicted last that, Certainly consistent. that is that is that is that is a uh, that is very consistent interpretation yes and if it had been the other way around that is if the head wound had been inflicted first and, and he had died immediately then that would not be consistent with your examination because those other wounds we know were not post-mortem correct That's correct. 
Which again is consistent with the brother's testimony. <laughs> yeah, although they did, I know Eric testified to just shooting as soon as he went into the room. He did end up in front of the coffee table, which would have been directly in front of Kitty at the time. And do you are you more specific about Lyle's position? Well, so Lyle ended up going behind the couch and inflicting one of the contact head wounds, which was to the back of Jose's head. So he ended up sort of in the bottom left corner of the room. So Jose had a contact wound to the back of his head. And we know this is a contact wound because all of the pellets and the gunpowder went into his head. So, like I was saying before, if it had been a distance shot, the pellets would have spread out, but instead they all went and made like one big hole in the back of his head and came out through his right ear. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a pretty picture. Apparently when they were carrying Jose's body out, like his like brain matter like started seeping out of his head. Ugh. Yeah. That's a weird uh fact. <laughs> but again, this is consistent with the brother's testimony because Lyle testified that he inflicted that shot. Do you remember firing a very close shot at your father? Um I believe so. At what part of his body? <coughs> um, from the side, behind, kind of. I ended up there. Um, I don't remember the shot, really. But I remember the picture. The picture you saw here? Are you talking about your dad's head wound? Yes. And do you think you did that? Yes. Yeah, I think in Lyle's testimony, he sort of says that this is kind of where, like, I don't know, he does, like, this weird sort of, like, cringe movement with his face, where he says, like, I think I was, like, to the side, kind of behind. That's the way he describes it. And that wound does, it, it is consistent with how he describes that. And I think, I mean, so there's no way to actually know what position the parents were in when each shot was fired, like the specifics of it. But based on Lyle's testimony, I think we can kind of assume that Jose, like when Lyle shot him in the back of the head, he was probably already on the couch, right? Yes. Yeah, he must have been. Yeah. Because the head wound is, like, on a higher part of his head, right? Yeah, he would have had to have been sitting down when he received that wound. Yeah, for Lyle to have been able to put the shotgun to the back of his head. Yeah. I mean, there's not much more to say about that. Yeah, not about that one, yeah. Okay, so... Kitty's body was found, like, in front of the coffee table, right? In between the coffee table and the the couch. Yeah. I think it can be assumed that she sort of fell in that direction because the way that she's positioned is, like, along the couch. Yeah. I mean, it, it can be assumed that she sort of did move slightly because there was like blood tracks found in on the like the sole of her shoes so that means she must have stepped in blood so she probably moved ever so slightly and that's sort of where she ended up yeah and that she really like she didn't really move far at all basically she like she's basically next to jose but on the floor yeah and that's where she was when Lyle had ended up 
behind the couch, like, could see her moving. Yeah. Lyle testified that he was the one that inflicted the contact head wound to Kitty as well. At some point, was your gun empty? Yes. And did you, was there something about your mother that you learned then, either through Eric or you saw something or heard something? Um, could see sort of behind my dad, really barely but could see somebody uh, moving, seemed like moving in the direction of where my brother should be. And uh, so I reloaded. You reloaded? Is that yes? Yes. And what did you do after you reloaded? I ran around and shot my mom. Where did you shoot her? I reached over and I shot her close. Was that the last shot that was fired? Is that yes? Yes. Yes. And this happened after he had run out of the room and then Eric in a, like a, I think, what, what, how did Eric describe it? He was like scrambling for any shell and he gave the shell to Lyle and this just happened to be a birdshot, right? Yeah. Lyle said that after he went around to the back of the couch and shot Jose, he saw movement coming from where Kitty was. And Eric said that he heard Kitty make a noise. Now, what was it that happened after the shooting ended? I heard a noise from my mom. And what was your reaction to that noise? I just ran out of the room. What did the noise, physically you ran out of the room, how did the noise make you feel? It scared me, I just wanted to get out of there. And where did you go? Uh, out to the foyer, to the front door. Lyle was right there. Where did you go? To the car. And when you got to the car, what did you do? Um. I started scrambling. Lyle and I were scrambling for any shell, any shell I could find, and I just handed him one. You found a shell? Yes. Do you know which kind it was? No. New one or old one? I didn't look. And you gave it to Lyle? Yes. And Lyle ran back in and reached over the coffee table and shot Kitty. The Kitty had one contact wound to her face. And this wound was birdshot. So this is consistent with the brother's testimony that they were just scrambling for any shell in the car and grabbed one and used it. And it just happened to be birdshot. Right. Like if... For example, this was this like Lyle went out to reload because he was just so determined to kill Kitty in that moment. Wouldn't he have just gra like grabbed a buckshot shell because he knew that that was more lethal? I mean, I think it just says a lot that they admitted that they had reloaded because there was no way to know that they had. Yeah. I still think their lawyers could have successfully argued that there was no reload. The way I see it, like, in terms of the coroner's testimony, 
even though he was a prosecution witness, his testimony, I feel like it did more to prove the brother's version of events rather than the prosecution's. That's how I see it anyway. I don't know if you agree or not. Yeah, I definitely agree. So we should add the coroner had some credibility issues that stopped him from testifying in the second trial. The, this happened around the OJ case because he conducted the autopsies of Nicole Brown Simpson and, oh God, is it Roger? Ron, Go Ron Goldman. And Ron Goldman. And he really messed up those autopsies and failed to collect all of the appropriate things he was supposed to collect. I'm pretty sure he, like, didn't analyze the food that was in their stomach, which could have shown, like, a time frame that, like, when they had last eaten, um, things like that. And he ended up not testifying in the OJ trial because of those mistakes. He also made some statements about like wanting to kill one of the lawyers or something like that. Hang on. Yeah, so in the OJ trial, the coroner made statements about killing attorneys in the OJ case. Uh <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> that was, yeah, yikes. Yeah, that's the only thing you can really say about it. He did also make a mistake on the Menendez autopsies, which was that he missed a wound on Kitty. He definitely had credibility issues, which meant he didn't testify in the second trial for the Menendez brothers. But I don't know. Do you think that that has an impact on his testimony from the first trial? I don't think it necessarily does, because I think if you've seen the testimony of the coroner, like, the way he describes the- like, he does a pretty good job of laying out, like, all of the wounds that he testifies about. I don't think his credibility issues in, well, this case and the OJ case necessarily discount everything he testified to. Yeah. I mean, I think he did a pretty good job explaining- how he came to the conclusions that he came to. Like we kind of went through with the wounds, like how he was able to determine what was a contact wound versus a distance shot and what was anti-mortem versus post-mortem. Like, those are the things that like matter to me, I guess. Like regardless of whether or not he missed the wound, I don't think that completely discredits the rest of his testimony. Yeah. It's one of those things where, like, if, if, if you want to think that, like, because because of those issues that he's had that completely discounts everything he said about the wounds, then, I mean, sure, like, it's, it's completely on need to think that. At the end of the day, to me, the crime scene is just so obviously emotion-filled that that alone to me is corroborative of the brother's testimony and I don't really need the coroner to tell me that. Yeah. But I think the details of it are interesting too. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that what the brothers say happened is shown in his evalu in the coroner's evaluation. Yeah, and it wasn't like the prosecution called in another coroner in the second trial like to give completely different testimony. Instead, they called in someone to recreate the crime scene going against their own coroner's testimony. Oh, yay. Now it's time for failure analysis. <laughs> okay, so in the second trial, the prosecution ended up bringing in a like an engineering firm, which... So the guy behind this is someone called Roger McCarthy. He was called to testify in the second trial because his firm uh, did a reconstruction of the Menendez crime scene. Uh, this reconstruction is also where the infamous Menendez myth, the kneecapping, comes from as well. So during in this reconstruction, it's 
they have it so that the brothers had basically snuck up on the parents and shot them from behind initially. And that that leg wound that Jose had, they sort of characterized it as being done in an attempt to like kneecap Jose. I'm pretty sure it was, it was like an engineering firm and they recreated typically they recreated um, automobile accidents. accidents. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. They were not at all experts in recreating crime scenes and they had never recreated a crime scene before the Menendez crime scene. I think this is just like an example, another example of how desperate the prosecution were in the second trial that they couldn't just use typical criminalists, crime lab experts, ballistic experts. No, they had to go to someone who had never even been involved (laughs) in the recreation of a crime scene before to get the picture of the crime that they wanted to portray to the jury. They couldn't even use their own coroner's testimony to show what they wanted to show. They had to go with this guy who was a friend of someone in the DA's office who had never evaluated a crime scene before and did a million dollars worth of work for free as a favor to his friend to show their version of how the shooting occurred. Yeah. And uh, let's just say there was a lot of issues with uh, how they came to that conclusion. I should add, I have not read the second trial transcript, so... It's also been a while since, like, I've gone over failure analysis. Or I should really be saying Roger McCarthy's testimony. I read it a long time ago, and I just briefly went over it recently. I do know that the prosecution spent, like, a month on this, right? It was a while... But also because Leslie cross-examined him. I mean, they had the, the defense had their like a, lo- a lot of witnesses to discredit them, but also Leslie cross-examined him for like days on end. Of course she did. But like the, the failure analysis stuff in the second trial, like including Roger McCarthy's testimony and then the defense discrediting his testimony, took up a lot of time in the second trial one example of like some evidence that was like blatantly ignored by failure analysis is that they didn't take into consideration that it was impossible to tell the location of the shooters like during the shooting wait what do you mean by that it's impossible to tell yes it's impossible to tell like failure analysis had their own recreation of where Lyle and Eric would have been during the shooting, but it's impossible to tell where they would have been at all times during the shooting, if that makes sense. So they sort of, like, took, made the assumption of where the brothers were and then yes. made their conclusions based on that? Yes, that's stupid. <laughs> Under the guise that, like, they were able to tell um, because, like, their engineering software, like, was able to tell that based off of, like, the wounds and, like, stuff like that. So they evaluated the wounds based on the assumption that the brothers came in from behind and shot yes. first, shot the parents from behind first, and then ran around and shot them from the front. Yes. Reminder again that um, Roger McCarthy had never analyzed the crime scene before and had never seen an autopsy or anything. Like, he was not an expert in the field whatsoever. The prosecution presented a computer graphic recreation of the crime scene, trying to establish the order of the shotgun blasts fired into Kitty and Jose. It demonstrated that uh, Kitty Menendez, for example, was on her back, lying on the floor at the time that most of the shots were fired to her body. So it demonstrated that these victims were not in any way a threat to the defendants. It was garbage. To come in and tell a jury that in a complicated shooting scene where 
10, 12 shotgun blasts are expended, which shot was fired first from which gun in what direction, and whether the victim was standing, turning, sitting, laying at the time they were received. It was laughable. Okay, so part of the recreation that is that they came to the conclusion that Jose's leg wound was post-mortem. The reason they determined that that leg wound was post-mortem was because it didn't bleed very much. Yeah. However, with shotgun wounds, um, sometimes shotgun blasts can cause blood vessels to spasm, which kind of stops any bleeding in the area from happening. So just because a shotgun wound doesn't have a lot of hemorrhaging, it does not necessarily mean that the wound was post-mortem. It could just be because it's such a big blast that it causes the blood vessels in the surrounding area to spasm. That wound specifically, because of the type of gun that was used, um, it's basically impossible to tell. Sort of similar to how like the rest of the crime scene is. It's such a messy and like confused crime scene that it is almost impossible to tell like 100% what happened. It's just such a blatant showing that the prosecution was so desperate to have something that they could use as like their smoking gun to convict the brothers that they had to rely on someone who wasn't even an expert in the field. The engineer in charge of the reconstruction said, quote, All we did was put together the most likely scenario of what happened based on all of the physical evidence that was available to us and all of the expertise we have at our disposal. It may not be exact in every detail, but it's as close as anybody is going to get. And then the article continues and says, Most telling, Gruwal, who's the engineer, suggests, is that for all of the complaining the defense has done about the firm's work, none of it goes to the heart of the matter which is that the shooting could not have occurred the way the defense said they had. Which, which, I mean, I would say it's just a straight up lie because the defense did then end up bringing in experts to discredit that. The defense ended up bringing in a string of experts essentially to complete, completely discredit failure analysis and uh, Roger McCarthy. So they initially brought in, I think it was they first brought in Deputy Van Horn, who was a witness in the first trial, but he was a prosecution witness in the first trial, right? Yeah. So he worked for the LA County Sheriff's Department, uh, specifically in the Detective Division's crime lab, and he, he was a firearms expert. Yeah. So the defense called him in the second trial, so he was sort of brought in to sort of discredit some of the Roger some of Roger McCarthy's testimony regarding like ammunition that was used and just how sh like how shotgun wounds are typically inf inflicted um stating things like Roger McCarthy talked about certain types of ammunition that weren't ammunition stuff of that sort um they then called a Ron Linhart, who also worked at the LA County Sheriff's Department in the crime lab as a criminalist. Uh, fun little fact, he was actually asked in the first trial by Pamela Bazanich to reconstruct the crime scene. Essentially, he came back to her and said that there was no way to reconstruct the crime scene, um, which is contrary to <laughs> further analysis. But there was no way to reconstruct the crime scene because it was just too complex. There were too many variables because there was two shooters, uh, two decedents. All, according to the evidence, most likely all four of them were moving during the shooting. And it was also impossible to tell the exact positions of where everyone was exactly at the time. And for that reason, it's, it was impossible to recreate the crime scene. Um, this is also similar to how I think Leslie in her closing argument also talked about how like 
it's such a confused crime scene that there was just no way to like reconstruct it at all. I mean, there are things like reconstruct it in terms of every person's movements and exactly how every single wound was inflicted. I mean, you can yeah. determine things based on how the wounds look, but that's can't be a hundred percent proven. Yeah. Like here's a quote from Ron Linhart's testimony in the second trial regarding uh, failure analysis and why their conclusions aren't accurate. So he said, and quote, it's my opinion that many of the conclusions that were reached in the written report and in portions of testimony that I read were reached without adequate foundation, and in some cases were reached by ignoring certain portions of the evidence that were available. End quote. Uh, before we get off of the Ron Linhart testimony, there is something about his testimony in the second trial that I wanted to bring up because it does link with the crime scene and is corroborative of Lyle's testimony, well, the brother's testimony that they saw their father standing up, like, in front of the couch. Um, if you actually look at the crime scene photos, you can see blood drops or droplets, like, on the floor. Uh, like, they're sort of in front of the coffee table. And hypothetically speaking, if those blood droplets are Jose's, that does suggest that Jose was standing at least 18 inches away from the couch bef like when he was initially shot. And this is uh, specifically part of Ron Linhart's testimony in the second trial. So that's another thing that links back to the crime scene and does support the brother's testimony about the location of their parents at the time, specifically Jose. There was one other... One other defense witness that was called to discredit failure analysis and that was Dr. Martin Fackler um, I could really just sum up his testimony in a single quote so that um, when he testified for the defense he ended up saying that the findings and conclusions of Roger McCarthy were contrary to fact and frankly nonsense so, I mean, that really tells you all you need to know about that testimony. I mean, I think it's just, like, at the end of the day, you have all these, like, reputable experts testifying for the defense that the prosecution's witness is completely unreliable. That's how I see it. Yeah. The second trial jurors have said that they didn't really consider failure analysis in their deliberations. But I don't know. I feel like if you're sitting through a month of evaluating a crime scene one way and then experts coming in and saying that their findings are completely false, that has to have an influence on how you think about the crime. Yeah. What was it you said to me earlier, like, about how, um, like, if you ask those jurors today about, like, how the crime went down, like, they probably rec recount, like, failure analysis, this version of the, of, of the events, right? Right. Like, I don't know, I'm just thinking, you know, at the end of the day, the jurors believed the prosecution over the defense, which is why they voted for murder. So because of that, they probably believe that failure analysis and the prosecution's presentation of that is accurate when literally everything suggests that it's not. <laughs> and so if you think about the crime occurring with the brothers sneaking up on their parents from behind and then shooting them with the contact wounds first and then shooting them in the front. Like, that seems 
even though that is like by all other evidence not how it happened that seems that appears premeditated i feel like there's like a big message here about how the prosecution will just do whatever it takes to get a win <laughs> yeah i mean i think that is definitely a big reason why they brought in this failure analysis stuff yeah i think they they, they just knew that they weren't going to be able to prove what they wanted to prove like through the use of like credible witnesses in the field of like crime scene analysis ballistics like forensics and so because of that they had to bring in something that was in my opinion completely unrelated to crime scene analysis to like get what they wanted I mean, I think the biggest evidence of that is that in the first trial, the prosecution didn't dispute how the shooting happened from the defense's version of events. Like, the kneecapping stuff and the shooting them from behind first, that was only brought in in the second trial with this recreation. So yeah. it's like, how do you go through an entire first trial where you're trying to prove premeditation and this doesn't come up and then all of a sudden it's like oh we've got this new evidence this new information that contradicts all of our evidence from the first trial like it doesn't make sense unless you were scrambling for any way to prove premeditation yeah. It is just really interesting to me, I guess. Like, I've been interested in true crime for a long time, and I feel like it's very rare to come across a case where, well, first of all, where the shooters or the killers admit to the killing, but also where the killer's description of what they did is so consistent with the physical findings. No, I agree with you on that. It's definitely rare. I don't think I've ever really seen it in any other case. I don't know. I mean, I think it just gives them a lot of credibility to me. I think it's another thing where it's like the the sort of like the general person like hasn't heard the brother's testimony, specific testimony about the events of the shooting. Like it's usually like chopped up or like edited for documentaries. But I feel like when you actually sit down and listen to everything that they describe about that night and then compare it to the like the actual crime scene and the photographs, like it all does line up. Like exactly. Thanks for listening. Um next time we'll be discussing the history of Jose and Kitty's relationship and the effect that that had on their two sons. So Hope you look forward to it.